Hey, Tourpreneurs, it's Mitch Bach. And just a quick note before we begin today's episode, Tourpreneur is currently sponsored by Google. We're thankful for their support of our community, and we are offering with them a completely free course helping you unlock the power and potential of Google's Things to Do program, which is specifically helping tour operators add their tours to Google in new ways that gives you new exposure and more direct bookings. To learn more, go to tourpreneur.com slash Google. And as always, show notes, more resources, links to our newsletter, our business coaching community, and so much more are available on tourpreneur.com. Now to the episode. Today's episode is sponsored by Blend Marketing. These friendly folks work exclusively on marketing tour and activity companies. They've just released a free ebook that shows how you can increase your direct bookings by stealing the OTA's top tricks. Check out that free guide at torpreneur.com forward slash blend, B-L-E-N-D. Welcome to the Torpreneur Podcast. Travel industry veteran Shane Whaley will take you on a journey with fellow Torpreneurs, sharing their tips, ideas, insights, and success stories to inspire you to make your tour business the best it can be. And now, here is your host, Shane Whaley. Hello and welcome to episode 120 of Torpreneur. We're joined today by Lauren Shannon. Aragato Japan Food Tours. Welcome back to Torpner, Lauren. How are you? I am great. And it's so nice to be back, Shane. I really enjoyed being on your panel session before. I don't know how many uh, podcasts that was ago, but uh, I'm happy to be back and really excited to talk to you again. I know it's weird. It seems like in a way that was just last week, but of course it was several months ago that, that we caught yep. up with you. And that kind of describes this year. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. In, in many ways. It was funny, uh, an image came up on Facebook for me the other day. It was a Facebook memory and it was a picture of me on a panel at Arrival. And it was actually Arrival 2017. And it was the first wow. ever panel at the first. Uh, but I was like, wow, was, was that only three years ago? It seems like 30 <laughs> years ago in many ways. You know, I was kind of like, this yeah. can't be right. I'll have to double check. Was it really 2017? Yeah. The, on the internet, on Twitter these days, they're calling this month March Tober, because you know we're still basically back in March. <laughs> it's been like dragging on forever. Yeah, I, I agree with you, and there's lots we could say about that. But today, I really wanted to talk to you about virtual experience because there is a lot of noise out there around virtual. This kicked in, you know, pretty quickly as we got into the lockdown with operators looking at ways of generating revenues. I know you've developed virtual experiences for your tour company and you even took that a stage further and you were giving webinars to other tour operators on how they could create virtual experiences. So you're a perfect guest for us today to find out more. Awesome. I would love to talk about it. We've had a really interesting journey with virtual experiences. And I think our take on it is maybe a little bit different than and what's out there in the in the media about this. Okay, so so what is your take? Let's start there. Why is it a bit different? Just like everyone else, we really weren't sure if we were going to try to go into the the virtual realm or not. But really early on, you know, the I guess the big players, the first to market for virtual experiences was really um, Airbnb. And they just came out strong and they really were able to like pivot their regular hosts to doing things virtually. And they're so community based that they had a lot of support right away. And that was actually a really great advantage for us because there were already some terrific people on Airbnb doing some virtual experiences. And what we did before we decided to jump in or not was we went on them. And the first one I can really remember, the first one I did was a Zoom around Paris. And this was like before I even knew how to use Zoom. So it was really interesting. But we did this Zoom around Paris and it was me and my business partners. And about 15 minutes in, we all kind of realized that this was a really cool way to make a very close connection with someone and some place that we wanted to visit in the future. And as soon as we finished it, uh, at the end of that virtual tour, all of the guests, there were about six different guests from different places around the world. And they were all asking for the tour guides information so that when they could travel again in the future, they could look him up. And we got off of that Zoom experience and we were like, okay, so 
now we've decided we're going to do this because I really felt right away. And I was a big proponent of this with my partners. I really felt right away that this could be a brand new way of travel planning, especially for a destination like us in Japan, where I think people are a little nervous about not having a local connection or not being able to get all their questions answered before they come. I think a virtual experience online is a much better way to make a really deep connection, get your questions answered, really do some travel planning. And most of them are less than the cost of a, uh, like a travel guide, even online. And of course, you know, you can get a lot of free information on YouTube. And we were worried about that at first, but connecting with somebody live and doing something together online and really making that connection, I think makes all the difference. So for us, we decided we were going to do it and we were going to go in big. And we also were going to plan on doing this after coronavirus. So that was a big key thing to us. We weren't going to do it if we thought it was just a stopgap measure, but we decided that we were going to kind of go all in on this. Now, I will say that it is not a huge money maker. So that's one thing that I'll be really honest about with everyone. Of course, you can't make the kinds of uh, revenue that you make on a, a, a food tour because we're a food tour company. Uh, and there are a lot of challenges to doing it, but we're really happy we did it for a lot of interesting reasons. So I want to thank you for saying that because, you know, when I created Swarpreneur, my whole goal was to flatten the, the learning curve for tour operators. And sometimes that means that I'm not going to be someone's friend, but I, I want to save them money. And I, you know, I wrote something recently about virtual experiences and I, and I got a ton of flack for it because I get very frustrated when I see certain people out there selling technology or selling courses and saying you can generate an instant cash flow. And, you know, I've asked, you know, I've asked on our, I, I want to be wrong. I would love it if I was wrong. I'd love it if you could put this thing live and, and make a living and pay your bills and see this thing out. And there are some companies out there that are doing that. And I invite them on the show so we can unpack what they've done. But I really want to thank you for saying that, Lauren, that, that says a lot about you and what you're trying to do. And I also love the idea of long-term planning here. It's not a, hey, we need to generate some money for this month to keep going. You're looking at that long-term. Yeah. So, I mean, I think a big difference for us is we realized really early when you talk about like a classic sales funnel, you want to have that low cost entry product that gets people to know you, breaks down barriers and creates leads for the future. So we totally changed our perspective on this and we really look at it more as a lead generation engine. And in that way, it has been really amazing. And I think there are some people who've made some money. Most of the people that are, in my opinion, most of the people that are making enough money to like kind of pay the bills with virtual tours are people that really went in and were already very active in the corporate events and corporate tour, like mice, you know, kind of travel, because you can make a lot more money tagging along with virtual conferences and seminars and being like the entertainment group involved in that. So I know there are a few companies and, and one of them uh, just did something for uh, Arrival Online recently about, I think it was Arrival Online, but anyway, about being able to, to do massive virtual tours. But that company was already really focused on big corporate events and big corporate tourism products, right? So it was a natural pivot for them. And I think if you can do sort of large scale tours like that, uh, it might work financially. But I would say that there are so many other reasons to do it that I really urge people to think about it because, and we came at it from a really different angle. I'm hoping you and I can talk a little bit more about that. But the benefits that we got from doing this are so um, interesting and so sort of around the periphery. So it's not a direct connection. It's really things that happen that were amazing around what we were doing. All right. So maybe what we should do is, is dig into the benefits first and then the how-tos. Before we get into that, I'm curious to know, your first experience in Paris, was that a video-based tour or was the tour guide on location, you know, the live stream? So this was really early in the lockdown and he was not walking around. And actually, even the virtual tours that we are still doing today in, in our company in Japan, we are, we're going to start experimenting with doing some like with a camera out and about, but that's very tricky in Japan because privacy laws are really crazy. And a lot of places won't let you come in with a camera and 
Yeah. So we are doing them not walking around. And this Paris one was really early on. And he was like a ninja at using Google 360 maps and really making you feel like, you know, you were kind of there with him. And the thing that really stands out is he used Google 360 maps and Google maps to show us a side entrance to the Louvre where you could skip the queue. So, you know, if you go to the front door, your wait could be like an hour or more. But if you go to the side door, he's like, he's never waited more than 15 minutes. And I was like, wow, I totally know this secret now just from like zooming around with this guy around Paris. Yeah. I asked that question because the the virtual tours I've been on were were video based and they were all right. You know, they, they were okay. But some of our listeners are like, well, you've never really experienced a real virtual tour till you've had somebody on location live streaming. You need, you need to try that first before you, uh, you know, come to an opinion. And and that's a valid comment. And I, I do want to try that and see if it is different. Our most popular one that's worked best is where we combine you know, the, the video being online without being out and about live, but we combine an interactive experience. So I think some of the most successful experiences online have been a lot of the food tour operators that pivoted to like cooking classes, right? So we didn't go that far, but for example, my favorite tour that I do, because I still do a lot of these online for the company is a green tea experience. That's the one I want to do. That's the one I caught my attention. Oh, great. So I spend a lot of time talking about green tea and I'm pretty geeky about it, but I don't get too technical. But then the really cool thing is almost everywhere around the world, you have access to green tea now, whether it's like tea bags or loose tea. And so I tell people before the experience to make sure they've got some tea on hand. And then I give them the easiest but best way to make a perfect cup of green tea at home. Wow. So no more bitterness, amazing flavor. And with a tea bag or loose tea, I give them all the tricks. And so we make some tea together. And then we talk more about the history and the culture behind green tea while we're kind of sipping green tea together. And including those kinds of like interactions has really been the most popular part of of what we do. So we're always trying to make it interactive, even if we're not walking around with someone. But I, I can see the benefit of that. And I, I can see why they do well, because you're able to taste that green tea. Whereas if I was just watching you with a special kind of green tea that you could only get in Tokyo, I'm like whenever I watch a food show on TV, I'm like, ah, oh, I'd love to try that pork or Wagyu or whatever. And, um, you know, you don't, and you have to imagine, but with, with what you're doing and with, with, with other classes, I guess it's, having that on hand to actually try it. So I really like that. I, I actually want to get on a, a cooking class at some point. I could recommend a really amazing one. I will send it and you can even post it in the link to the, the Torpreneur podcast. But this couple in Argentina does an empanada class wow. that anyone can do. And it's super fun. And it's it's a longer one, but the time just flies by. And they even include some history and culture while you're rolling the dough out. And it was really, really fun. Is it two way? Are they able to give you feedback on what you're doing? Yeah, actually, they made us hold up what we were doing. And like they had a show like how we were folding it over because, you know, empanadas, there's a lot of decoration that goes into it. And so they were giving us feedback all along, which was really fun. Uh, You know, everybody's got to be flexible enough to have a camera that you know, your laptop or your phone that you can move around in the kitchen. But in our group anyway, we were, we were able to do that. Yeah. So Lauren, you were saying there were some surprising benefits to hosting virtual experience. Can we run through a couple of those? Yeah. So these are three of the reasons I would really recommend tour operators that have the opportunity to do this and have the resources to do it, to at least try. So the three things that really surprised us, um, the first one was probably not so surprising, but it was surprising to me is this was a really great way to keep our network of guides engaged. So In the creation of the tours, in training them to be able to do them online, this gave them a little bit of work, but more importantly, it kept them connected with us. And actually, all of our tours were sort of generated by the team. So we would come up with the idea, everyone would brainstorm, we would put together the images that we wanted to use, do practice tours that our team would watch and give feedback. And through that whole process, especially in the beginning, I think when everyone was pretty scared and stressed about the whole coronavirus issue. It kept us together. And now I think much further down the road, what it's doing is it's letting us not get rusty. 
So we are still talking with guests, um, having that practice, having that experience. And so I think restarting when we are um, working, we're going to be launching domestic tours this month, and then we will be doing inbound hopefully next year. But I think our people will be still really motivated. So that might be obvious, but it was an added benefit that kind of I realized as we were going along. But the other two were were pretty surprising. So the, the first one is, um, and this may be particular to us, but I think there's a lot of operators in this position. We try to list with lots of different agencies and tour operators and the onboarding process to get onto an OTA or to meet a new agent uh, or to join a new platform can sometimes take a really long time because we're all the way over in Japan and they don't know us. So what we did was we just started contacting our current tour operators, but then lots of new tour operators uh, and just inviting them to do a virtual tour. So we didn't charge them for it, but we would mix them in with regular guests so they could see how the guests reacted. And the amazing thing about this is we connected so much more quickly and so much more immediate and deeply with these other companies, especially smaller tour agents around the world, that it shortened the onboarding process of like getting a contract, working together, sending our products by about half of the time. So instead of waiting for somebody to do a fam trip all the way over in Japan, we invited them on a tour, could see the quality, get to know us, ask questions. And some of our agents that we've worked with in the past actually asked us to do special tours for them for some of their clients who couldn't travel or had to cancel their their trips. So we even got business directly from those tour operators. And one really big success story was a a small Italian travel agent that we had gotten in touch with like a year ago before coronavirus uh, had never, they'd never connected and gotten the contract and all that. We invited them on the green tea tour and we had uh, an agreement signed with them in like a week because they loved it. And yeah, so it was really amazing. So that was a really big one. And then the other thing that this has really done for us is I think a lot of people work in influencer marketing in our, in our industry, you know, and you wait for influencers to come, or sometimes they contact you before your trip and you have them on the trip and they do all of that. Well, what's great right now is that just like us tour operators don't have guests right now, the influencers who are real like sort of travel junkies, they don't have much to do right now. So we were able to reach out to a much wider variety of travel um, writers and bloggers and Instagrammers, get them to come on the tour. They did a ton of media for us. This was also picked up by um, a lot of online magazines. We got so much promotion at a time when we kind of would have fallen off the radar we were able to like get all of this great media leverage and also keep getting reviews on TripAdvisor and Google because we ask people for reviews for the online tours too. So I think algorithmically and you know SEO wise, it's it's been a really big benefit to keep that going. And I think the travel writers have been really appreciative because they were stuck at home too and and they're missing you know that opportunity. We've also been able to give away some of the tours. We did a first responder push early on because we really wanted to give back. So we just said, you know, if you have a doctor or nurse or frontline worker in your life and you want to do something with them to help relieve the stress, you know, let us know. So people put us in touch with folks like that and they came on the tours. And so it really made us feel like we were still sharing our passion with Japan. But business-wise, we got this benefit of new agencies and also media outreach that was really, really surprising. Fantastic. Yeah. And so I think it's a a good thing for people to think about. If, If you have the resources, I think it would be harder if we were back four years ago when we started, if it was like a solopreneurship, it would have been really difficult. But what is your advice to a solopreneur right now who wants to build a virtual experience slash tour? Is it something you'd advise them to do? I think it really depends on their situation. If if their area has reopened and they can focus on a pivot to domestic, uh, that might make them more money and help them pay the bills. But if they were able to get some support, you know, had a little bit of money in the bank and they can do both of those things or they can't do domestic, if they're really, really focused just on inbounds, uh, this is a really good way to still connect with 
travel partners, agents, influencers, and have some guests come and, and take your tour. And a lot of platforms now are listing virtual tours, so you can get some, some traction that way as well. So yeah, I would say, you know, if you have the resources, but be, be very honest with yourself. It does take time. It doesn't take a lot of money, but it does take time. And if you've got that time to spend, knowing that, you know, the average amount that people pay for a virtual tour is between like 10 and $40. That's what you're going to make. That's a good point because there was a bit of a discussion on our group recently. And if you saw it, so with Amazon getting into that, well, they're beta testing experiences yeah. and it's, it's such a small world. I felt quite bad about this, but I highlighted that there was a Prague city tour, one hour tour, tour virtual experience. And I said, look, this is $85. Do you not ask in the community, do you not find this to be expensive? And um, the lady who runs that tour is on the group. So <laughs> she told me off. Um, but again, I'm like, okay, that that's one hour city tour, $85 versus what you're saying, you know, 10 to 15. I think this is the other aspect of virtual experiences. What, what's the value to people on that? I think if you're a really well-known expert, so uh, I know that a lot of chefs yeah. And a lot of like quite famous people are getting into it now. But, yeah. you know, you're up against something like Masterclass where you can pay, you know, $190 for all of the courses with some of the most famous people in the world for a year pass, right? Yeah. So I think on the online learning side, we do have to be honest that this is not, I mean, I think this will probably be controversial and people may disagree with me. And maybe there's some tour operators out there that are, you know, doing really well with this financially, but the benefit for us, you know, hasn't been strictly financial. It has given us a lot of opportunity. And I think that is, is invaluable in a lot of ways. It also helped us, you know, we have gotten some opportunity. So the, the third thing I wanted to mention that was really, really powerful is I think the power of virtual tours is as a marketing thing, not just a tourism product. And so what we did really early on was we reached out to partners in Shizuoka Prefecture, which is like prefectures are like states in Japan. And so we have a partner in Shizuoka that we had made an offline tour with in the past. And right before coronavirus, other cities in that prefecture were talking about doing an offline food tour with us. So this, this is a connection that we already had. But I got the idea to talk to them about doing a virtual tour because this prefecture is not as well known as like going to Tokyo or Osaka or Kyoto. And what a great way to get people to know before they come here next year about this more remote or less known area. So actually we got a contract and we're doing a collaboration with a, one of the states in Japan to create two virtual experiences focused on their area. And that was much more financially successful. So that actually, yeah, so they're paying us a good amount of money for it because for them, if you look at it as a marketing expense and not as a tour product, then it really makes sense because, you know, even if you're charging them a few thousand dollars to develop it, it's cheaper for them than any kind of advertising. So you're going to spend more than that, even on Google ads or on any sort of magazine or television, and it, it will last longer. So what we've promised them is that we will market, sell and operate this tour to promote their area for a year. And they were really enthusiastic about it. So we're about to launch that tour now and it's around the Mount Fuji area. So it's a beautiful tour with lots of great information. Let's unpack a couple of things you said there. So you mentioned time. How much time did it take you to develop? Let's say, you know, you have, I believe, four virtual experiences that you're offering right now. What would you say um, in terms of how much time did it take to develop those? Well, the first one took forever, right? right? Like the first, I mean, we, my, my business partner, my main business partner is really motivated. So she kept us moving and she gave us some really good deadlines. Um, I, I tend to be a little bit too perfectionist about it. So it right. probably would have taken me longer, but we got it out there. And I think everyone needs to realize that just like our regular tours, these things are iterative. So you put it out there, you get feedback and then you change it and update it and you keep moving along. Right. So I, I would say the first one probably took us a month end to end. So we started right away in March and we launched at the end of the month. Um, we were taking guests in the beginning of April, but since then we've gotten it down. We have a very strong process and I would say we can do it with a team of about 
five of us and nobody's full-time, but me that is helping me. Like the guides are not full-time, but they all help. And I would say we can get one together in about two and a half weeks. So okay. that's pretty good. We decided not to do tons of them because we want to promote the ones Smart. we have. But yeah, and the prefectural one is taking a bit longer because of course we're balancing the things that they want to promote. But if we talk about your own tours, because I, I want our listeners to understand how long these take to put together. Did you go in any courses or how did you go from, you know, never having touched this world before to suddenly having four virtual experiences? So we took a lot of other people's virtual tours and saw what we liked and what we didn't like. And we have a pretty strong core identity anyway. So we were like, okay, this is who we are. How do we translate that to doing it online? And, and we started with a cocktail tour actually, and it was for sort of expat locals to start. And then we took it kind of globally and it was like making cocktails together, inspired by Japanese ingredients and answering your travel questions. So it was kind of like hybrid, you know, travel consulting and cocktails. That one is one of the most fun ones, but it's not the most popular one because a lot of people can't get the ingredients. Yeah. So they get a little bit nervous about it, but it's been really fun to do. And, and it's definitely gotten, it's gotten some rave reviews. I think the green tea one was the most successful. And I made that one pretty quickly after the cocktail one, because I saw the pattern. Yeah. So I was like, okay, we need something that is very cultural that we really love that we can be excited about, but that people have access to. Understood. And how do you cope then? Think of logistics. So let's say I'm here in the United States, the green tea experience caught my eye as someone who's trying to be more healthier and drink more green tea. But how would you cope with that time zone? Because right now it's, it's late at night for you as we're recording here and it's, it's morning for me here in Vermont. To catch as many folks in the U.S. as possible, we offer morning and nighttime slots. Um, right. And then we also take custom time slots. So if someone's interested, they can always contact us and we try to find the best time for both groups. So we move around the times a lot. We don't just offer a standard time. And then luckily, uh, one of the gentlemen who is our was our HR coordinator before all this started happening. So he's been doing the online tours with me and he's a night owl. So I'm an right. early morning person. He's a night person. And with the tea tour, it actually works out well. I can do it as late as eight or nine at night. And that's kind of morning in the U.S., I've done it at 10 too, but that's a nice time to drink green tea in the U S right. so, uh, that works out well. And then when I do it during the earlier part of the day, I catch a lot of Australians, New Zealanders, a lot of Europeans. So yeah. we kind of like spread it around. Um, but we're pretty flexible about it. And, you know, if I take a nap in the afternoon, I can stay up late. I can't drink much green tea then because then I don't sleep. Yes. Uh, so yeah, the cocktail one is easier at night because I can have cocktails and then go to bed. Right. But the green tea one's a bit of a challenge. Absolutely. But it's been fun too. I presume you're using, you're using Zoom. Yes. And I would recommend people don't mess around with a lot of other stuff for two reasons. I think Zoom is a pretty stable platform. I think they've done a really good job fixing what went wrong and they've been very responsive, even with some of the early mistakes when it, the world was suddenly on Zoom. But the other reason why is now this many months into the pandemic, most of your guests will be comfortable on Zoom. Yes. So you yeah. don't have to, you don't have to teach them how to use the technology. When we first started doing the virtual tours, we would start it out by saying, okay, who's used Zoom? And it would be like one in four people yeah. had used it before, but now everybody, like I hardly ever have anyone on a virtual tour anymore that doesn't already know how to use Zoom. So. I just cry when I see that Zoom stock price because I bought a couple when it IPO'd, but I never added to it. So, because I was ah. asleep. So, you. Well, at but, least you have some of them. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, uh, yeah, I do. Um, but again, it's interesting you, you raised that because I used to use, in fact, I think last time we did this, I used a virtual studio to record that a purpose built for podcasts. And the audio is better than Zoom, no doubt about it. However, I've made the switch to Zoom because most of our guests have never appeared on a podcast before. And a new tech, it's, and there's the online green room. You know, I, I had to spend 20, 25 minutes just getting people set up. Whereas Zoom, bang, straight in. Everyone yep. knows how to use it. Everyone is set up. Even though I lose a little bit in audio quality, I also think that, you know, we're so used to seeing people on the news using Zoom interviews now. So we're kind of more in tune with um, what Zoom sounds like as an interview, whereas we certainly wouldn't have been last year. 
you know, sometimes you just got to go where the zeitgeist is. You can make it more complicated, but really, you know, this 2020 is complicated enough. I think where we can simplify, we should always take that Absolutely. that path if possible. Yeah. And and if Zoom happened to be listening to Tourpreneur today, we are taking sponsorship <laughs> for 2021. <laughs> Did you know every weekday Shane curates the most interesting news articles in tours and activities and sends them out in a snappy daily digest? Grab your copy of the Tourpreneur Daily Briefing at www.tourpreneur.com. How are you going about marketing your, your experiences right now? I mean, you mentioned going to tour operators and some influencers, but how are you getting out to the general public? So a lot of the influencer and media has helped a lot. We invited all of our previous guests that have taken our tours in the last four years. And a lot of people came from there. Then we have done um, everybody who had to cancel. So anyone who couldn't do a tour that they had planned to Japan, we were able to reach out to them and say, Hey, you know, you can't come, but I'm sure you're, and because everyone wrote us, they were so sad to cancel. So this was something fun that they could do to plan their trip. And, um, and then we always have relied predominantly on organic social media, marketing, um, Instagram, Facebook. We do a lot of stories about what we're doing. We do some Instagram live where we talk about the online tours. Um, and we just try to tie it together in as many ways as possible, but we've never really spent a lot in marketing for our company overall. Um, we try, we really rely on trying to, to be as innovative in terms of, you know, working with with partners to help promote. Uh, One of the really fun things, I forgot to mention this earlier, another crazy benefit that we found was when I started the green tea tour, I was like, why don't I talk to green tea companies and see if they are interested in coming on and giving me some advice, but also in sort of trading affiliate programs. And so in, in when we, whenever we do an online tour, we provide information, you know, for the green tea one, I tell people where they can order even better green tea in their area, because a lot of people are, you know, just using supermarket tea or whatever, but I know all of these suppliers around the world who um, deliver green tea in the U S or Canada or Europe. And so I wrote, reached out to those people because I was already talking about them on the tour. And most of them have been more than happy to be interviewed by us for our blog. And then they promote the tour to their followers. And a couple of them are even putting in a a coupon in their packaging. So if they sell green tea online, um, they're putting in some information about our online experience for their customers. So, and I think you could do that with a lot of different things. And as I said, I think it's more a marketing tool than just a straight up tourism product. So we're experimenting now with talking to For example, we could talk to a sake brewery and we could say, how about we do a virtual experience about your brewery and we can get images from you and stories from you and come and visit and take video, kind of weave these things all together and let people know about your product. And I think that could be a really fun collaboration for a lot of tour operators that have deep knowledge and stories to tell about their areas. They could kind of finance this by making it a marketing thing for a small business in your neighborhood or, you know, a a place that you really love visiting. This is a great way for them to advertise for future travelers. Absolutely. I think that's a great idea. I was just thinking in my head that, um, was it two years ago, somebody bought me a bottle of Japanese whiskey and, you know, I have Scottish family, right? So that's like, hang on a minute, (laughs) hang on a minute. And it was actually really, really good. Yes. So maybe that's another potential for you there is, you know, the Japanese whiskey tasting and, you know, because yep. they want to do a lot of PR. They want to promote their whiskey around the world. Yeah. And I'm actually working on a new cocktail for the cocktail tour that uses Japanese whiskey that's readily available outside of Japan, because yes. I think that's an ingredient that a lot of whiskey drinkers would be interested in. Definitely. And then we can talk about the history of Japanese whiskey and do some, some tasting and, and talk about what makes it so great. And then also give them advice on distilleries they can visit when they come. Yeah. And we actually have a whiskey and cocktail tour in Kyoto. So it's a great way to cross promote. So always during the tours, I talk about what we do offline. Yeah. So it's, it's a great way to, to generate leads. When I look at this space, virtual tours slash virtual experiences, because I think they're different things. I do tend to see it's the F and B tours that are doing very well. It's food, it's beverage, as opposed to, um, you know, visiting a city. 
for instance. And, and I'm hearing that from you as well with your cocktails, with, with green tea, you mixing in the history with the F&B, others that I have seen doing particularly well. It does seem to be F&B is the clear winner when it comes to virtual experiences. I don't know. I've, I've been on a few that are not, I mean, our predilection as a food tour company is like, we yeah. can't do anything without talking about food. It's just who we are. Sure. So we're kind of obsessed, but um, you know, there's a great Harry Potter tour in London that went online. Who's Harry Potter. <laughs> there's a, there's a, there's a, there's some really good museum ones. Yes. Um, there's a, a guy who uh, talks about sort of, I, I want to say it's like, I can't remember where he is, but he talks about his area, but also this area was famous for a few famous magicians. He shows a couple of magic tricks, but he talks about the area. So I think it, it can work, you know, and it's funny that you say that because in the beginning we were really worried about virtual tours because we're a food tour company. We we're like, how does that work when people can't be there and eat it? But like you said, people are very comfortable watching food shows on TV. So I think if you're interested in the research and you want to know more about the food before you travel there, and you know, Japan's people are very motivated to come here for food. So it hasn't been a problem. Uh, we actually have one of our virtual tours is sort of the origin stories of five of the most popular foods that you have to try when you come to Japan. Brilliant. I love yeah. that. I see that working for Japan. I don't necessarily see it working for London, for instance. I would totally go on a tour where somebody was telling me about what pub culture is because it's very different, right? There's yeah. all kinds of rules that people don't know about in how Especially people interact now. in pubs yeah. and there's all kinds of history and there's all kinds of, you know, like I never knew about the thing about, you know, getting locked in after closing. Like I never knew about that. And someone just told me about that recently. And, right. you know, I think there's a lot of food culture in London and in Britain as well. And certainly if you went out into the countryside and you did something that was a little bit more remote, it could be really interesting too. So, But I think my, my point is you are in quite a unique destination. You know, we see a lot of, you know, New York or Los Angeles or London in Hollywood cinema or on TV. I, I remember when, when I moved to Sweden years ago, everything was brand new because Sweden's not really on television. Whereas when I moved to the US, I knew exactly what I was going to get on Thanksgiving. I knew exactly what I was going to get. <laughs> I had no clue in Sweden that they have a Christmas ham that they eat. So, I mean, things like that, Japan, I think is that unique destination, which I think is very helpful for you. Yeah, it's, it's probably an advantage, I would say. So here was one other funny story about doing online tours. Uh, we connected with all kinds of other food operators around the world who were also experimenting with online tours. So I think in general, the pandemic has brought operators together to kind of common purpose and sharing best practices. But it was even stronger, I think, in the food tour community. So now I know all of these food tour operators like in Peru and Argentina and London and Jamaica. And so I think that's that's been an interesting outcome. And a lot of them were working on sort of online experiences. So we shared a lot of feedback for each other, which was great. So a, a big question I've got for you is, you know, this all sounds quite easy, launch a virtual experience <laughs> or a virtual tour. But of course, when we're in person, and I've had to learn this doing podcasting, right? When, I, when I'm having interviewing somebody in person, I find it easier because we're there, we have that chemistry. Whereas podcasting, I'm speaking to 10,000 people a month, doing it like looking at my screen. So how do you tell engaging stories when you lead your, for instance, your green tea or your cocktail experiences? What advice do you have to keep things engaging? Because it is a very different medium, isn't it? It's really different and it's always a challenge. You'll always have some people that took the tour but don't connect. But I think it's the same in, in real life too. I think when you have, especially if you do group tours of mixed groups, you know, most of the time you can really make these strong connections. Some people, it, it's more difficult. But having said that, like for online tours, I think you have to do something interactive, whether it's using like the polling function on Zoom or getting people to like draw a picture together or, you know, write down three words that they think of when they see some image that you show. Something that's quite interactive breaks down barriers. But I would say just like with real life touring, it's really important how you start out. So you need to explain what you're going to do. You need to let everyone know they can ask questions as you go along. You need to do introductions of everybody that's in the group. 
find out a little bit about them. Don't just let them tell you my name is so-and-so and I'm from so-and-so. You want to find out something they like and you want to try to relate to them during the tour. So it's a yeah. lot of the same skills that we train our guides on anyway. And you have to work even a little bit harder on online. So you got to have your jokes ready. You need a sense of humor. You know, you need to deal with technology problems like we had earlier. So I, I think it's challenging, but it, it's still within our wheelhouse as tour operators. It's stuff that we know how to do. You just have to amp it up a little bit, I think, online. Yeah, I think that's really good advice because I, I know from doing this that the minute you shove a microphone under someone's nose or a camera in front of them, we, we tend to freeze or act differently than we would with, without that. And I think what you're exactly. saying is don't forget the good habits and skills you have in an in-person tour and bring those onto virtual. What would you say are some of the drawbacks for you of virtual experiences? Like I said, I think it's sometimes harder to connect with people I think that in the beginning, a big drawback was nobody knew what they were. So yeah. everyone was like, what is this? I don't know what to expect. And some people, even though we were quite clear that we were not taking a camera out and about, people still thought that was going to happen. Or they thought on the Tokyo tour, we were going to be able to share something about like 20 neighborhoods in an hour, which doesn't work. It's a little bit harder to control if you're doing mixed groups and you have someone that's a very dominant personality. That's a little harder to control online. I think we've got some good tips and tricks when we're out physically in a place with people, but online, someone can really be the person who asks 800 questions or, you know, corrects the guide and things like that. So that can be a bit challenging online, I think a little bit more than offline. And then I think I just miss, you know, the spontaneity of things that happen when you're out and about. So people notice different things. I think the online tours can get a little bit predictable. So I build in as much surprise and I try to change things up a little bit as I go along um, because it is kind of a set pattern. Whereas even though we have those patterns on the tours, you know, when you're out in the city, anything can happen and yeah. your guests are going to respond to what's going on around you. So I think that, that that's a little bit fresher. So I think you have to work a little harder to keep your, to keep yourself fresh in, in online experiences to make sure that it's something new all the time. Very good advice. Lauren, before we wrap up, I just wanted to ask you, so I've noticed you becoming, I, I don't really like this word celebrity, but I will maybe <laughs> use the word personality. I see you speaking on a lot of webinars such as Arrival and various others. How has that transition been for you from running your own tours in Japan to being, you know, on all these online events and, and conferences? I have always loved public speaking and I had gotten away from it for a long time. And I think actually you inviting me on the podcast was probably the, the first one that I did. And, and then I just pestered Douglas and Bruce over at arrival because I really wanted to do something for arrival. I really love arrival. I I've found for me anyway, it, it has been a great experience and I've met so many great people. That's where I met you actually the first time you, I'm sure will not remember me, but I walked into your booth in Orlando because I was one of the only people from Asia that came to the yes. Orlando arrival. And so I just sort of pestered them and I said, what can I do? What can I do? And they finally gave me something to do. And it kind of built from there. And then, you know, we were going to talk tonight. I'm, I'm, I always talk to you, I think, longer than we both expect. But we were going to talk a little bit about the webinars that I'm doing. And that was a big thing. So doing a series of five webinars, one of them was about how people can create their own online tours. That was really huge for me personally. I felt like I developed a lot preparing for that and doing that with my team. And so now I'm quite excited to, to share. And as a company... We turned a corner where, and this is, a, I'm sure, from the pandemic, and this can be like a, a silver lining for us, is we used to be a little bit more worried. And I think a lot of people were more worried in the industry about sharing what you know. There's so many competitors, so many people around you doing what you're doing, and how do you distinguish yourself? But because we've all been going through this really traumatic thing, as a company, we just decided we wanted to give back and share knowledge. and help guides in Japan be ready when things reopen because we felt like, you know, if we're all in this together, we can all help each other. And so many people had inspired us when we went on all these online tours and got ideas that we wanted to give back. And so a big reason that I've been uh, excited to accept a few speaking engagements, I would not say celebrity, but yeah, you I, are. I, I, I see you. I, I see would, you. 
<laughs> I, I've, I've been really excited to, uh, to do it because I want to share what we've learned and I want to learn from other people. So yes. always when I do this, I learn more than I give. I try to give as much as I can, but honestly, I feel like I learn more from talking to folks like you and, and doing these things. I learn more about the industry and myself by putting myself out there. So I recommend that people do it. People should come, more people should come on your podcast. There's so many great stories out there um, that need telling and I would yeah. love to listen to them. So. Absolutely. And I, I would love to ask you about your, your five webinar series. So was, was that a paid series or? Yeah. So we have some particular challenges for inbound in Japan. A lot of Japanese guides spend a lot of time studying a lot of knowledge, but there isn't really good training for guides in Japan on engagement. So native speaking Japanese guides have a little bit of a difficulty with the ideas of storytelling. They end up just sharing a lot of straight up information, which for inbound doesn't work very well. So that was the origin of the idea. We were like, we want to help people in our community here in Japan during this time when we're all kind of improving and getting ready for next year. So, you know, people are redoing their websites and redoing their tours. One of the things that you can redo is you can revisit learning about guiding. And so that was where the idea came from. And we did a series of five. And the first one was really fun because it was like, 10 things foreigners want to know about Japan that will surprise you because it's always harder to talk about your own culture. So we were telling our Japanese guides that yes, foreigners are really amazed that there are 5 million vending machines in Japan, mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, and then we just, we came up with a series of five topics and they, they all did pretty well. And we did charge for the series and you could join one or all. If you joined all of them, you got them a little bit less expensive. And then we made videos of them as well. And those are also available for purchase. So this was actually more financially successful in a lot of ways than the, the less expensive virtual tours, because we really were sharing a lot of very deep knowledge that we've gained over the last four years. And that was really worthwhile to a lot of the guides who joined. I love it because, you know, I don't endorse many courses on the show because many of the courses I see out there are just not that great. And, you know, I, we're, we're both big fans of Mitch and Alan at Trip School. I, I love the yep. stuff they put out. But with them and with yourself, this is lessons from the front lines. This is lessons from the trenches. You're not one of yep. these jackals who I saw early on in Corona. Like, oh, I can do entrepreneurial coaching now to all these poor, desperate tour operators about how to get through this. And they'd never even led their own tour. They knew nothing about the industry, whereas you have these years of experiences in the trenches. And I always say that to our listeners, you know, when you're evaluating a course, first of all, come to our group and ask, hey, has anybody done this course? Because our group are very honest. We are independent in that way as well. Um, but also to ask the, the people on the course, well, what's your experience in the space? And do your own due diligence. So with you, with your years of experience of, you know, taking foreigners around Japan, I mean, that's gold for other Japanese tour operators to learn from you. And, you know, we do everything iteratively. We really value the community just like you do. So every webinar had a survey and we really asked people like, what did you learn from this? What didn't you learn? Did it meet your expectations? How can we do better? And I think that is critical to any success is being, you know, humble about what you can offer, but always being willing to learn. And, and you know, we had some some tough critics. Uh, yeah. early on. And so, but we learned from it and, you know, we're still here, we're still doing it. And so we're, we're actually thinking about launching a, a tour guide Academy, not quite like trip school very much. We're going to do it domestically in Japan and deal with some of the really specific issues that guides face here. Yes. Um, but we're really excited about it. And that came out of all of this experience of feeling more excited to share what we learned and having people be really receptive. So I'll say that the community made it so much fun because there have been so many lovely people that we met through this. Yeah. And I wanted to share this because I think for some of our listeners who may, for instance, you may have somebody in adventure travel who's been able to tap into local marketing and, you know, generate revenue during a very tough time. Have a look at your skill set and say, well, what have I delivered? And maybe you can make a course on that or webinar. I think we've all done things during this, this pandemic that, other people want to learn from. And if you want anyone listening in today, if, if you're curious about that, email me at shane at tourpreneur.com. I'm happy to talk to you about ways you can do that or come and ask on our Facebook group. Because I'm not saying yeah, that. Yeah, because you know, apply. everybody's bored making, you know, sourdough starter now. They're ready to <laughs> learn something else. So I would love to learn. And I think, you know, 
It's interesting across industries, you know, we tend to silo ourselves, outdoor adventure tour operators and city operators and food tour operators. And, and there are really unique things about those categories, but yes. actually we can really learn from each other. We can. we can really learn a lot from, from people in different specialities that still apply to what we're doing. And we all face a lot of the same challenges. And I think, yeah, I'd love to take some classes from, from different segments of the tour community actually. Yeah. So if, if anybody does contact you, uh, let me know because I'll sign up for their class. So Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think if we can solve real world problems, not the fluff and stuff that's out there, but real world problems. And if you can say, for instance, yes, I used Facebook ads and I was able to generate X for my local tours. You know, there is an opportunity to build a course, make some revenue, do some good and help out tour operators on the world. And I'm focusing a little bit on marketing there, but it could be, for instance, you know, with, with, with what you're doing, Lauren, you know, in, how do you tell stories via Zoom? That's a skill yep. in and of itself. And if somebody wants to get into virtual experiences, maybe they would take that course because, hey, and I need to learn how to do that. Same way I had to take courses for podcasting on the yep. technology side and also how to interview um, you know, yeah. it's not something you just wake up and can do, but if you have these real life, real world skills, maybe there is a revenue opportunity. Hey, Lauren, I've taken up a lot of your time. I know it's getting late for you there. I'm very disappointed your dog has not made an appearance. You, you promised Here, me that your you. dog right. would. He's right. Oh, He's right. What's your dog's name? <laughs> His name is Archie. Archie. What a cute dog. He's tired. He's named after a, an old detective series in the US, the Nero Wolf books. He's named after Archie Goodwin. Uh, I think if I'm thinking of the right one, a good friend of mine has a podcast on that series. I'll have wow. to pick that for you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, please. I will. That'd be great. Lauren, where can people find out more about you and your tours? So please come to arigatojapan.co.jp and you can see all of our online and offline experiences. And I'm not sure when this podcast is going to go live, but I am going to be participating in Arrival 360. And I'm also a member of the World Food Travel Association, and we're going to be doing some things with food trucks with them as well. There's a lot. There's a lot coming up, right? There's Arrival, there's the food yeah. trucks, there's Gift yeah. Forum Asia this week. Yeah, there's a lot going on. There's another I'm conference. Yeah, there's, there's a lot. <laughs> I know it's almost like the start of the pandemic, all these virtual you know, exactly. webinars hit us, but there's some good stuff out there. And I do say to our listeners, you know, do check these things out, especially Arrival. I mean, if, I'm biased because I'm taking part on the last day, I think day five, but, you know, Mitch and Alan at Trip School have put together a fantastic day of learning for two. Yeah, I'm doing two years. workshops during that day. So you yeah. and I will be there on the same we day. Will. So. We're going to need to yeah. have lots of green tea that day, I think. Awesome. They're doing a, a cocktail hour at the end too. So, so we'll, we'll have a drink after it's all over. We will. Lauren, thanks a million <laughs> for coming right. on the show and all the best Thank to you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Torpreneur podcast. Be sure to visit torpreneur.com to join the conversation and access the show notes, including links to the resources mentioned on today's episode. This is Torpreneur.